Hi, and welcome to Maine Challenge. I think you all were rightly horrified along with me to learn and watch as over 800 Mainers died from this COVID-19 pandemic. But you know, at the same time, the number of Maine people who died of drug overdoses just in 2020 was over 500 and 11 people a week in Maine are dying from drug overdose. That's an epidemic too. That is receiving much less attention, much less work, and unfortunately, there's no vaccine against substance use, a substance use disorder, but there are medically recognized treatments, best practices that lead to recovery and long-term recovery. In Maine, too often, our approach has been way behind the times. It has been punitive, counterproductive, and racially biased. Our drug trafficking laws are among the very harshest in the country with people spending 10, 20, 30 years in jail for simple possession of certain substances. And we, it is time to change and the country is beginning to change. My guest today, Representative Charlotte Warren, who is a represent, Maine State Representative from District 84, and Courtney Allen, who is the Project Director of the Maine Recovery Advocacy Project, are here today working, and they are gonna talk about how they are working to change that. Welcome to you both, and I am so happy to have you both with us today. Um, it's such an important topic and such an epidemic that we are not talking enough about. It's not receiving enough public attention or enough policy attention, but I know you two are working on it. So Charlotte, Help us out with a little bit of where we are now. What's the scene? What I mean, what's the, what are we looking at right now in Maine? Thank you, Betsy. And thank you for having us on today to talk about this very important issue. Um, one of the things that I try to remind my committee members every day, and I try to say five times a day, is 11 people a week are dying right now from something that's preventable, and it's overdoses. So that's where we are. We also are, are we also are in a place where we are still, although we say that we don't want to arrest our way out of this problem, we continue to try to arrest our way out of this problem. We have the most arcane, some of the most arcane drug laws in the country, and we have one of the highest overdose rates in the country. Mm. Although we have an administration that has prided itself on, you know, talking a lot about trying to give people hope when you are still giving people shame and stigma. Mm. It's hard for that hope to make it right when you are providing treatment <clears throat> to some folks, but still uh, criminalizing and stigmatizing people's medical condition. You're kind of working against yourself. So we still spend a lot of money on law enforcement officers and on locking people up and not enough money on treatment and resources to reduce stigma and actually give not only the people that are suffering from substance use disorder, but their children mm -hmm. and their parents and their neighbors and their communities hope and belief that we can solve this epidemic if we start to actually do what the data and the research and the evidence says works. Yeah. And that's not what we're doing right now. Yeah, and that's one of the things that's so frustrating is that there is evidence and data and research that shows what works. But Courtney, let me ask you, so for a long time, right, we had the war on drugs, which was really a war on people, and um, often a war on people of color and low-income people and folks who were people who had substance use disorder, which is really a public health issue. It's a health issue, and but we turned it into a criminal issue. So where are we in, like, where are we in, in beginning to change people's mindset about, you know, I think a lot of people say, oh, drug deal, dr everyone who takes drugs is a drug dealer, they're violent, they're criminals, they should be locked up behind bars when really it's a health issue. Can you talk a little bit about that disparity? Yeah, absolutely. So in the state of Maine, we're talking a lot about substance use disorder, right? There's this growing movement and understanding that substance use disorder is a disease. Um, but what we fail to recognize is that one of the, the criteria of a substance use disorder is the use of drugs, right? People have to use drugs to uh, have a substance use disorder. 
Um, but in the state of Maine, the simple possession of substances, uh, a symptom of somebody's substance use disorder, is a crime. And therefore, what we're saying on one hand is that we want to support people who have substance use disorder, especially people who are in recovery, because it's a little easier for folks uh, once you've entered that you know, sustained recovery. But we say that, right? We say that saying out loud, a lot of rhetoric around it. But then we go out and we arrest people for simple possession of substances. In 2018, we arrested over 1,800 people. What we know about substance use disorder is that people get well in community and with their with their with access to connection, right? And so there's four pillars of the recovery process. It's called health, home process, uh, purpose and community. So people need a safe place to live connections to, uh, treatment, uh, PCPs, all the healthcare access that we all need, right. Purpose, a meaningful reason to get up in the morning. You know, for me, it's my job and my children and being in, involved in policy work. And for others, it's other things, but that thing that you get up in the morning for people in recovery need those, that too. And then community uh, and meeting meaningful access to that. And what happens in jail is the exact opposite of that. It takes away people's access to safe housing, access to purpose, access to health care and access to community. So we're literally doing the exact opposite of what we know affects and sustains recovery. So, Courtney, you laid it out beautifully, right? Those are the things that we know work. And it's like we, we're adding, we're taking people with a health issue and we're criminalizing it. Like as if we were going to arrest people who had cancer or arrest people who had diabetes and put them behind bars without access to treatment, right? I mean, that's just, if we said that, people would say, oh, that's ridiculous. Don't do, you know, that, that's, but, but that's exactly what we're doing. Charlotte, help us understand why you think we haven't made more progress in shifting this debate. I think one of the things that we all need to challenge ourselves to do is check our beliefs about people that use drugs. Hmm. We need to ask lawmakers and the governor of this state to check their beliefs about people that use drugs, because we were all born into a world that believes in the drug war. We believe that Drugs are bad. Selling drugs is bad. Using drugs is bad. Therefore, those people are bad. Mm. We see it as a moral failing, a character flaw, right? Now, we don't see people who drink a glass of wine in the evening after work as bad. We actually celebrate those people on social media. They're in our shows and our uh, yeah. commercials, et cetera. But whether we know it or not, we have this lingering, lingering idea of who these people are. If we didn't mm -hmm. have that, we would never as main people be allowing 11 people a week to die from substance use disorder. We are allowing that, make no mistake, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and I believe that that is because we still cling to that idea that somebody who has substance use disorder is somehow different than me and you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, is, that is not the case and we need to change that. Yeah, and that belief I think affects, right, is affecting our laws, our resource allocation, where the where we spend the money. I mean, that's the other thing that I think is happening is that when, I mean, uh, there's all the things that are the right reason to do it, but just in terms from a pure uh, taxpayer issue, we're paying to keep people in jail when if we would spend much less money on recovery services and the four pillars, as you talked about, Courtney, right, we would, it's a, like a win, 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 right? It's a it's a win for our crowded, overcrowded jails and our county commissioner budgets and all that stuff. And it's a win for the people who are seeking long-term recovery. So, um, Courtney, is the stigma really that strong? It is, it is. So we talk a lot about stigma and I, I love talking about stigma. And I think 
stigma is something that we, when we talk about it, it's something like that doesn't feel like it's near us, right? Other people do stigmatizing things. Mm -hmm. And so that's not even what we're, what's happening in this conversation. What's happening in this conversation is discrimination because when, Mm -hmm. when, when money and resources are added and we make decisions based on biased and uncorrect and outdated ideas about a certain population of people, and then we withhold resources, that's discrimination. And what we're talking about is that people who are in recovery and need access to all of the things outside of uh, the criminal justice and public safety world are not getting those things because we're acting within our, our implicit bias around people in recovery. Mm. Use drugs. Yeah. And, and so Courtney, um, talk a little bit. Um, so you're a city councilor, yes, also in Augusta, which is awesome. Um, congratulations. And we are, I'm so thrilled that you are there helping make decisions in Augusta. Um, and so did you overcome that stigma? Talk a little bit about h- helping people get there. Like if, I, if someone wants to check their own bias, because I think you're right. You and Charlotte both said it. We all have it. I think we all have it. I don't think we recognize it. I think I was talking to someone last night and preparing for the show. And they said, you know, we think we either have people who are down in the street, like literally criminals in the gutter, right? Or we have Hollywood movie stars who are checking into the fanciest rehab center we know. And people don't think about anybody in between. And they don't care about the Hollywood people. And then again, as, as, as Charlotte said, I think they judge everybody else as having a moral failing. And they and we do it with mental health as well. We do it you know, with substance abuse disorder and mental health. We just think, oh, well, they should just buck up and do it. But well, we wouldn't do that to someone with, as I said, cancer or diabetes. So talk, can you talk a little bit more about that? How we can, how, like, how can, how can you help us all overcome some of that bias? Yeah. So in my personal recovery journey, I've chosen to recover very loudly um, and to be very proud of my identity. I see re- being a person in recovery as one of my core identities ingrained in everything that I do um, and how I act within the world. And, you know, I encourage anybody on this show that, you know, may identify as somebody in recovery to think about coming into that process, because what I found is that if I didn't tell you that I was in recovery, you probably would have no idea. I'm like an average everyday citizen. I bring my kids to school every morning. I serve on my local city council. I go to my college, right? And I am in community with the people around me. I have wonderful neighbors. Um, And so I guess like what I'm trying to say is like for folks that have not been around people who may be in recovery or people who are using drugs, um, they're probably right next to you, like somewhere within your community and seek out some of these people because some of us, I don't want to say these people, some of us, some of your community members um, and get into relationships with them because the recovery community is so much bigger than just like people who may have had a problem with substances. There's also like family members. There's so many family members who have been affected by the addiction crisis that you are also a member of our community. And we also have an allyship community and we want everybody to be involved um, in our process. And I love our, it, we have a culture like a whole entire culture around the recovery community. Um, And I think it's a pretty wonderful one. So can you talk a little bit about what kind of laws you're working on changing and why? Yeah, thank you. One of the the sort of leading uh, proposals that we have right now is LD 967. And it would turn simple possession of illicit substances, right? What we call them in drug statutes. (laughs) It would turn that into a civil penalty instead of a criminal offense. It would mean that folks had an exit ramp as opposed to getting pulled right in to the criminal justice system, which is very Mm -hmm. expensive and not effective. Um, It would mean that somebody that gets caught with this substance is given, you know, a a civil uh, citation, you might think of it as similar Mm -hmm. to you get caught speeding. Right. And when you get caught speeding, you either pay a fine or you show up to court and fight it, whatever. This would allow you to either pay a one hundred dollar fine or get a health assessment. And so it's an intervention point. 
it's a it's a warm hand to someone that may or may not be struggling with substance use disorder. And that's the piece that we need to remember is in the same way that many people use wine or a bottle of beer at the end of the day, and they don't necessarily have an alcohol use disorder. There are people that use all sorts of substances that don't have a substance use disorder. Mm -hmm. And when we immediately involve them into the criminal justice system, we are costing ourselves a lot of money and we are putting up barriers. We are much more likely to force them into a substance use disorder, right? When Mm -hmm. you know that when your life is harder, when you have more trauma, you are more likely to have issues with substances. Instead, we give you a health assessment. We provide you with an opportunity. We provide you with a way to not be sucked right into the criminal justice system. Um, That is sort of the basis of LD uh, 967. Um, It takes away that criminal um, charge for simple possession and provides an opportunity for intervention. And as Courtney said, there were about 1,800 people last year um, that were charged with simple possession. And as she also said, that means we have criminalized the symptom of their disease. Mm-hmm. Courtney, Courtney. There's some real world effects when we give somebody even a simple misdemeanor drug possession. Um, on housing, you know, there's most landlords conduct criminal background checks uh, for housing. And if somebody has a simple drug possession, it's going to be real hard to get somebody to rent to them. Right. There's also the effect on employment. When people go and apply for a job, you have to check the box on whether or not you have a criminal history. That's going to often put your application right at the bottom of the pile. And then on education, if somebody gets charged with drug possession while receiving FAFSA at the federal level, at the, if they're in college, they can be denied FAFSA for the rest of their lives. So what we see as like these little, like maybe it's not a big deal, um, has these real world ripple effects that that cause a lot of barriers in everyday average citizens life, but also connect right back to those four pillars of recovery. And so we're, we're literally building barriers to the recovery process as we're trying to say that somehow jail is going to save their lives or help them get into recovery, because that's the rhetoric we're hearing right now is that we're going to put people in jail um to save their lives but then it's going to make it nearly impossible to enter uh into recovery so it it just makes absolutely no sense to me so it seems like there are like many pillars of problem here right so so that what you just described courtney is so um important for people to understand that once you um are tangled in with the criminal justice system then it shuts a lot of other doors and makes just living, (laughs) forget anything, thriving, but just living really, really challenging. So I know that there are uh, places and some efforts to start, you know, the other thing that um, Charlotte, I've heard you say many times is that when someone calls 911 because someone's having a, a overdose issue or something else to send someone with a gun and a badge instead of someone with an ambulance and a, and a substance abuse counseling degree or, you know, or s- skills, right. It seems just absurd. <laughs> just, I mean, it just seems like, like that, that's just a crazy thing. Um, and I know Charlotte, you're working on trying to get some crisis services that are not, um, police related. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. Thank you. So, you know, we in Maine, have a crisis system that's the envy of a lot of other states, what other states are trying to build. We just don't fund it properly. Again, Mm. we, you know, it's really easy to get legislators to vote to fund police, jails, and prisons, right? It's almost like your cred as a politician. Of course, I support police, I support jails, I support prisons, I support public safety. They're very expensive and they should be about just public safety. 
But trying to get lawmakers to support the upstream, what's actually effective, crisis intervention, right? A system we already have, which we don't adequately fund, which, in, which includes three very simple things, a phone line, right? Crisis line that either I can call if I'm in crisis or my mom's in crisis or a police officer can call. Mobile hmm. response, somebody, folks that are actually trained as social workers, as crisis workers that can come to the scene, be there with the person as they're experiencing this medical, medical happening of an overdose, right? Provide Narcan, provide resources, support the family, Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and crisis stabilization units or residential crisis, a place for someone to go that doesn't need somebody who does not need the emergency room and does not need county jail. Right. Yeah. We already have that system. It already exists in Maine. We just need to adequately fund it. Police should only be dealing with public safety issues. Police should not be dealing with everything from my kitten is in a tree you know, to, you know, just and everything in between. So um, so that is a, a bill that we're, you know, moving through as well. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, and what kind of difference do you think that would make, Courtney, if someone was having trouble? Do you think it would increase the number of people who'd be willing to call for help if they knew that they were going to get support and get some help intervention and that was going to lead to them getting support and either temporary or long term recovery support? Do you think that would make a difference? Yeah. So what we see on the ground um, in, in regards to the addiction crisis is that folks who are using drugs are terrified of mm -hmm. the system. Um, they're terrified to call the police department um, when they are experiencing a medical condition of an overdose, because for so long, every time a cop has shown up, somebody goes to jail. And what that Ha what happens from that is that folks aren't getting access to EMTs when they need EMTs, right? And so we, we wonder about this, but it, it makes perfect sense to me um, when you have been excluded from and pushed away and harmed by something, you don't call them, right? And so um, I we need to like remove this medical condition from the police department. They have so many other things to be doing, um, that the, 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 the EMT department uh, can, can take care of those things. Like we just put in a, a grant application in the city of Augusta for a program that we're gonna be calling Project Recovery. Um, and it's modeled after Operation Hope uh, in the Scarborough and Waterville Police Department. And those programs, somebody can walk into their police department and access instant access to treatment or recovery support services. And mm -hmm. I was looking at that model and, you know, I, I appreciate all of the hard work that Scarborough and Waterville has done to try to help their folks. And while I was working on building out that program, I recognized that the police department is not the place for this. It's not the place. Um, and so we chose to write our grant application out of the fire and EMT department in the city of Augusta as a deep recognition that this is a medical condition and that we want folks who have that training to be the ones that welcome our community members into our building and get them what they need. Yeah, I, you know, it's interesting. I think that um, we're seeing a little bit of an attempt to get mental health services and substance use disorder services in jail, um, in jails and in our corrections, which seems like that is the absolute wrong place and the wrong thing to do. We need to have those services in the community adequately and adequately funded, as you said, Charlotte, um, you know, not not bringing these services to jail because our jail should, right, as you say, right, our jails shouldn't be our mental health centers. <laughs> Yeah. So, so I don't want to leave this. We're running out of time, which is unbelievable. But um, I don't want to get out of this without talking about the racial implications, because in Maine, they're they're significant. And I know, Charlotte, you've been working on that. Can you talk a little bit about what they what you see on the ground? Absolutely. What we know is that uh, persons of color and Caucasians, white people, let's just say white people and black people use drugs and sell drugs at a similar rate. Evidence has shown us that for decades. That's evidence everywhere. It's in Maine. It's nationally. It's over and over and over. Black folks and white folks use and sell drugs at 
equal rates. At every level in the criminal justice system, there is a larger and larger disparity of blacks and whites when it comes to drug crime. So even just the first interaction of what you might call arrest, there's a disparity of 5% in Maine now I'm talking. Mm -hmm. As you go deeper and deeper into the system, so felony drug trafficking crime, there's a much higher incidence of uh, persons of color being prosecuted for those um, crimes than folks that are white. We have a population in Maine, an adult population of about 1% persons of color. In our adult system, we have an incarceration rate of 12% persons of color. When you look at our youth system, our, our kid prison, right? We call it all sorts of fancy things, but it's a kid prison. Uh, it's 24% youth of color. So that data is clear. There is systemic racism in the way that we prosecute drug crimes in this state. There is no other way to slice it because the data is very clear that folks use and sell drugs at an equal rate. Yeah. If you could just share with people two things, what is, what gives you hope um, in terms of this journey and where we're it's shifting this narrative and what we can do for people? And secondly, if people want to help and get involved and be allies or get help if they are um, wanting to be in recovery or are in recovery and want support, where do they go? Yes. So what gives me hope in regards to the conversation around restructuring drug sentencing laws is I've been in this work for a while now. And last year, we were not having the same conversation that we're having this year. Um, this year, we had five hours of testimony in support of uh, restructuring drug sentencing laws from doctors and public health professionals and people in recovery and our allies and faith leaders and just so many people that weren't at the table that are coming uh, to the deeper recognition that we know substance use disorder is a disease and that we don't want to criminalize our folks anymore, that these are our people. Um, and that we want to take care of them. And so that has given me great hope to continue this conversation with Mainers across the state, um, who I love so much. I love this state and I know that they love us. So that's what gives me hope right now. Um, and if anybody wants to get involved in the Maine Recovery Advocacy Project or any of our allied organizations across the state, we're working to redefine justice, access, connection, and recovery in all kinds of different ways. Um, we have a Facebook page. Uh, you can just look us up, me rap. Um, and if you need uh, help getting into treatment or recovery support services, the state does have a new uh, webpage options.me, knowyouroptions.me. Great. Awesome. Well, thank you both so much for the incredible work that you're doing and for being two of the leaders that are changing this conversation and making, um, giving lots of people hope. And those of you viewers, thank you for tuning in. And if you have any interest in helping and helping with legislation and helping with being an ally or want help yourself or for a family member, you are looking at two of the people who will make sure that that happens. Thank you so much. And um, we'll have you on again to talk about this really important conversation because we're just getting started. Thanks so much.